and share my screen here. Okay, well, welcome everybody to our April Symbiota support group. Excited to talk to you all today. And uh, let's just start out with a couple of announcements from Lindsay. Awesome, thanks, Katie. We only have a few this week, so this part will be pretty short. Um, so if you're going to spinach, um, there will be an IDIG bio and GBIF data help desk. So there will be people from Symbiota on the ground there. So if you need in-person support, definitely consider looking for us. Um, Katie will be there in particular, I'll be there virtually. Um, so just a heads up, if you're going to be in San Francisco, keep an eye out for us. And then importantly, so IDIG Bio is now accepting registration and abstracts for the digital data conference. So this is the week immediately after spinach. This will be hybrid. There's no cost to join virtually, although um, there's like a suggested reg registration like donation, but it's going to be in Tempe in person. So we'll all be there. And um, we highly encourage everyone to consider this. Um, we know it is like the week after spinach, but it'll be a totally different focus for this conference. And we'll put a link in the chat to the information page about this. This is a really, really fun conference. I like going to this one particularly. Sorry, go ahead, Lindsay. So this is the first time it's been in person since pre-COVID. So yeah, really exciting. Yeah, very exciting to be able to see everyone and, and discuss in person. OK. okay. So today's topic that we're going to run some demos on is tools in support of the extended specimen. And I'll give a little bit of background about what that means if you haven't heard this term thrown around. And then we'll talk about specifically how um, I did buy or uh, how Symbiota um, deals with extended specimen data. So first of all, the extended specimen was this term that was coined several years ago to um, approach the fact that a specimen is a lot more than just a, a, a physical object. And even just the collection data around an object, it's actually much more than that. It is uh, the additions that get put on the additional data that are attached to it. So you can think of sequences, you can think of the descriptions that come uh, based on looking at that specimen, you can think of all these layers. And so this is a figure that's often used to kind of describe this concept because in the center there you have your physical specimen and that's kind of the core object that we're dealing with. But then you have these um, kind of extensions or tiers of the extended specimen. You have your physical specimen, but then you have the digital record that's associated with your specimen. And you have the, the media associated with your specimen. So images or CT scans or anything else related to that specimen. And then you have measurements and sequences. Those are another extension. And then you have derived data products. You might consider those the tertiary extension. So things that are still linked to your specimen particularly, but um, kind of have used that specimen's data or um, added a different type of data or linked the data. So that's what we're talking about when we say extended specimen is we're talking about um, different types of data extended and built upon what information actually surrounds each specimen. So the tools we're going to be talking about um, in Symbiota that support extended specimen data are the following. We're going to talk about the trait scoring tools. Um, these are have been uh, enabled in a few portals and you have the ability to create traits. Um, we're going to talk about the linked resources tool and the multiple types of resources that you can link to a single specimen using this tool or this tab. That includes associated occurrences, checklists, duplicates, and uh, genetic resources. And then in the uh, spirit of this beyond this tertiary extension, I'm also going to briefly talk about taxon profiles um, because they are kind of information related to your specimen linked by the taxonomy. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about traits. You can consider these kind of like the secondary or maybe the tertiary uh, extension of your extended specimen. I'm not really sure 
what the difference between traits and morphometric data is in their explanation, but maybe what they were thinking of is like traits of taxa rather than traits measured from species, from specimens. Um, but what I'm gonna be talking about are the traits tools that are used to measure traits on individual specimens. So they're not used to like say, you know, all of these plants flowers are pink. Um, these are mostly of individual specimens. You would say this flower on this specimen is pink. So um, as often happens when we are talking about these things in symbiota support group, I want to refer you to the documentation. We have pretty good documentation on using traits um, in our symbiota docs. So please take a look there. And Lindsay is going to be throwing all these links in the chat for your guys' reference. So if you want your information in word form, that's where you can go. So again, like I mentioned, the trait tools in symbiota portals are used to characterize traits of specimens. So these are measurements or they generally categorical at this point. Um, they, we probably will develop tools to enable actual like measurements that involve numeric, but right now the ones that we have available are um, categorical. You choose between some options. So here's an example of a um, specimen that has trait data associated with it. So I think there are probably three or four portals, well, three or four databases, so probably about 20 portals that um, have some sort of trait available to be scored. Um, and if you had some sort of data that you actually wanted to score from your specimens, we could include those traits in your portal. You would just have to talk to us about how to get that um, scoring schema there. But this is what it looks like. In the occurrence editor, you have a trait and you could have multiple traits available um, for you in this tab. But within that trait, you can have different states. And then those states you can, uh, you can in this case, say present or absent. Um, you could alternatively have a trait that says, you know, what type of um, leaf shape does it have? Okay, we have our, our options are, you know, ovate and elliptic and whatever else you want here. Um, you could alternatively make traits that are, um, you know, leaf length. If you, you could do that categorically right now by saying like leaf length is, you know, zero to three centimeters, three, uh, four to six, something like that. Um, but if you wanted to learn more about how to actually put these traits in, let us know um, because right now we have to do that on the back end. There aren't any tools for manually creating traits, just for coding the states of traits that already exist. So let me show you this in practice. Oh yeah, I put a handy link here. At least I think I did. Okay, so here's this specimen. And to look at the trait data, I'm gonna go into the occurrence editor. And then there is a handy dandy traits tab. And then uh, you can select what traits are there. You could clear your coding. And then you could also um, say how you got this coding that you're creating. So if you're looking at a specimen right here, you're probably saying that the source is viewing image, but there are other ways of coding traits. Oops, move to the next page here. So there are in particular three ways that you can score or code trait data currently. One is from the occurrence editor. So that page that I just showed you, you go into the traits tab and you just um, click on the traits that um, the states that are uh, associated with your specimen, you click save and you're done. But we have some um, quicker tools for doing more specimens at once. One of them is the image scoring tool. So I'll open up this one and I will zoom in a bit. So if from any um, collection that you have editor access to, you can do this. So you would go into my profile, occurrence management, and then the name of the collection that you would like to trade, uh, 
code traits in. And then if you go down to this option, the third from the bottom in the data editor control panel, and you click occurrence trait coding tools, you have two options. One of them is trait coding from images, and one of them is trait mining from verbatim text. If I click trait coding from images, then I can filter based on a fairly limited filter right now. It's just taxon and location. But let's see if I want to do some helianthus sunflowers. Then it will just bring up all of the specimens of this genus in the collection that I'm currently coding in. And I can view them. I can pop open my little trait box here. And then I can score them, save and next. So here I've got a flower. I've got hard to tell, but that looks like a bud. Um, Asteraceae is particularly difficult because they have lots of teeny tiny flowers stuck into these floral heads. But let's say I'm only confident enough to say that there are flowers and buds. You could just say flowers and unopened flowers. Save and next, and then it will load me the next image that I can start scoring. And if you had multiple traits available in your portal, then you could switch between different traits and you could trade, uh, do one trait or another. So then the other option you have is the trait, uh, the text scoring tool. And oh, gotta get out of here. Back to my image scoring tool. So if you go back to the data editor control panel and you go to occurrence trait coding tools and select the second option, which is trait mining from verbatim text, um, you do have to be pretty cognizant when you're using this because uh, you're making an assumption that the information that you're seeing on the label is actually referring to that specific specimen. So in the case of phenological traits, which is like flowering and fruiting in plants, um, then if it says, you have to make some assumptions about, um, if, if it says flower red, am I gonna assume that it's talking about that particular flower on the sheet or is it talking about the taxon in general? So this is one of the reasons why um, our tools will, will um, track what type of tool you used to create the phenological scorings, because then if you go in the future and you're like, oh, I don't trust anything that was from text, then you could exclude them from your, um, you know, your data analyses or whatever you're doing with the data. So um, what this will do is you select which trait you want to score. We only have one trait available in this portal. And then you select the field that you want to extract the, the, the data from. So you might get something from habitat, you might get it from the description field, you might get it from the occurrence remarks. You might try a couple um, of these fields because depending on how um, consistent your students were or whoever was doing your data entry, you might have data in multiple fields. But let's just say I wanna look in the description field for the word flower. You could also filter by tax on here if you wanted to. If I click get field values, I don't know how many are going to have flower in here. So this might take a little bit of time. We have scored most of our specimens already. Okay, so we have some options here. And what you can do is these are all of the verbatim values that contain the word flower um, from the description field in my collection. And so I could go through here and decide what assumptions I am willing to take that are going to allow me to score um, this, this particular trait. So I could say, okay, I'm pretty sure that means that there's a flower there and then there's a flower there and these have flowers. And once you're done going through those, so the reason, the way that I, um, selected multiple as I just clicked and then held control. I think it would probably be command on an apple. Um, and then, or you could do click shift if you want to do a lot. Um, but I usually just go through and individually click the ones that I think refer to one trait. And then I could click all of these have a flower. 
batch assigned states. And then it's going to batch apply that trait to all of those specimens that um, are associated with these values. Okay, so once you have all of this trait data and they're scored according to these particular um, uh, schemas that have been lo loaded into the portal, where do those data go? Where can I go to look at them in the future? Um, depending on the portal, there are tools that have been developed that enable you to search for those traits um, from the front end. So the CCH2 might be the only one that currently has this available, but we do have a trait search capability here based on that same um, trait. And so this is something that if you would be interested in um, having enabled for your portal, you would probably need to talk to your portal manager um, or to the Symbiota Support Hub to figure out um, what traits the community is willing to put on the, uh, the search page. So if you're like, look, I have tons of data about this and I have a lot of people who want to be searching on this data, then that would be a good reason to put that uh, trait criteria on your search page. Um, but regardless about whether the data can be searched, it can still be downloaded from any portal where there is trait data. And that would be downloaded along with, actually I should go back to that page. That would be downloaded along with any other data that you have, as long as you're downloading it as like a Darwin core archive. So let me show you how you would do that. Let's just say I want one collection and I want all of their helianthus. And if I went to download here, in the download options, you'll see that one of the options that I can include in my download is occurrence trait attributes. So that is going to be a separate file in my Darwin Core archive that has all of the trait information. This is currently the way that the data are um, structured because it's kind of our most extensible format. You can't just put or if you put every single trait into the, um, the main occurrences file, then how are you going to deal with multiple traits per specimen? Um, so instead, that's in a separate um, file. And this file is called, whoops, the extended measurement or fact file, or just in your Darwin Core archive, it will just say measurement or fact. And this is based on a Darwin Core extension called Extended Measurement of Fact. And the fields that you'll find in that file are things like measurement ID, so that's going to be a, a unique number. The occurrence ID, that's going to be a number that combines your main occurrences file to that measurement or fact file, so it's the unique ID number connecting those two data points. Measurement type, measurement value, so when you go and look at your measurement or fact file, it's going to contain a value for each scoring that exists. Okay, before I move on, are there any questions about the trait data? Let's see. I'm good looking in the chat. What other types of trait scoring projects are available in portals that Herbaria would be using? I think currently there are only um, phenological traits being scored. We've had some discussion with the uh, folks at the Lichen Herbarium, or the Lichen Consortium, about putting um, measurements about chemical tests that have been made on lichens as a trait. So I think that's kind of still in discussion or in process. And then uh, Rachel asks, can you export that return as a CSV? Um, Rachel, are you talking about the um, all of the the traits that were exported or that we created? Okay, great. Um, let's see. Can one generate distribution summaries on the fly? Uh, Mary, do you want to elaborate on that question? Do you mean like distribution of the the traits? I think you're currently muted. Uh, 
how many there are in each category? How many traits? How many of the specimens you looked at are in each category? Mm, that's a good question. Um, currently, no, there's not a lot of um, like results that you can view in the search results that involve the traits. You'd have to download those data. Um, one thing that exists on the CCH2 is if you go to a taxon profile page, um, actually that not for a genus, it would have to be a species. This, um, it does have tools to aggregate the phenological data for the, uh, for the taxon across the entire collect, uh, entire portal. So you could look at summaries of the entire portal, but you can't necessarily look at summaries uh, based on your one search. Okay. No, that's the sort of thing I was looking at too. Um, I was thinking too in terms of numbers and years and yeah, and lengths and years and things like that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. This is nice for um, this portal particularly because then you can say like, oh, if I want to go find a flowering one, I should go out in August or September. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Deb asks. Can I assume that mushroom traits are out of the question? Um, as far as I know, nothing is out of the question about what you can create a trait for. I don't think traits currently exist or have been developed based on mushrooms, but you could um, talk to the folks at the Myco portal and see if they're interested in putting any um, mushroom traits in there. Um, Allison says, I've been adding measurements in notes pages or in descriptions, such as lichen chemistry. Where would it be best to put for eventual extraction into extended measurements? Yeah, description and occurrence remarks would, would be just fine because you could later go and harvest those data um, using the text mining tool like we were talking about. Uh, Rick, sorry, you've had your hand up for a while. That's fine. Um, I'm wondering for adding new data, is it possible to include these fields in like an upload profile? Currently, no, but we could do that on the back end. Okay. Thanks. Great question, though. That would definitely be something we would want to do in the future. It's just a matter of making sure that people have them um, formatted in a way that could be ingested because it is this you know, separate measurement or fact file. Oh, and then Deb, Andy is in, Andy, who is one of the um, portal managers for Myco Portal is right there in the chat. So you can talk to him too. Frank. Yeah, um, I was gonna mention that we have had some discussions of um, using this for ecological data as well, um, Katie and I, and so, we might be working on that for the Lycan portal as well in the future. Yeah, it's just a matter of figuring out um, like the categories that would make the most sense and making sure that it's like specimen level data, which yeah. we're always, we're working on. All right, then let's go ahead and move to the next part here and talk about the linked resources tab. So the linked resources tab is just like the traits tab. It's another tab in that occurrence editor. And you have multiple things that you can add using this particular um, set of tools. So you can add associations in general, associations between the specimen that you're looking at and other resources. And the other resources that are currently um, covered in this tab are associated occurrences. So other specimens or samples or something that are stored somewhere else or taxa. Um, checklists, so if you have a checklist in a specific portal, you can link that specimen to that checklist as like a voucher. Um, duplicates, which are just kind of another form of associated occurrences, but that those tools were developed first, so they're still kind of separate and then genetic resources. 
So you can consider those are, these are all kind of like secondary extension pieces to this specimen. Although when you talk about checklists, that might be more along this tertiary extension. It's not super important. It's not like there's gonna be a quiz about what's a secondary and tertiary extension. It's just kind of useful to think about. Okay, in its most basic form, this is what the link linked resources tab looks like. It has a separate box for each of those types that I was telling you about. So there's an associated occurrences box, there's a checklist voucher box, there's a specimen duplicates box, and then there's a genetic linkages box. So depending on the type of association that you're going to create, you're going to interact with one or many of those boxes. So um, let's talk about the first box, the associated occurrences box. So this is what you're going to use when you're trying to link your specimen to some instance of a specimen or a sample or a taxon that is either within your portal or outside of your portal. It can be either way. So let me get out and go to another example. Um, so the three types that you can link are occurrences within your system, which means within that same Symbiota portal um, or database, um, external occurrences, which are links to, let's say, Arctos or some GBIF record or some specify record or, um, you know, a, I don't know, something else where it has specimen data, VertNet, something like that. Um, and then you can also add observational references, um, which is just another way of saying um, not an actual specimen stored somewhere. It's just someone made an observation that this particular taxon was associated with the taxon that you're currently looking at. So back into my data editor control panel, back into a random specimen, And let's go into this linked resources tab. So here, right next to traits. And here are the boxes that I was showing you before. So associated occurrences, that's what we're gonna talk about first. And the reason why I give you all this setup is that when you click on this plus sign that says create new association, you're gonna suddenly see a lot of boxes that might be a little confusing to navigate, but I'll walk you through them. So when I clicked on this, it gave me, okay, create a new association is this largest, largest box. If you had any previous associations, they would show down here in this whole associated occurrences box. And here are the different types that I was talking about. Here's an occurrence within system. Here's an external occurrence and here's an observational reference. So you just got to decide what type of uh, association am I going to create? So in this case, let's say that this specimen um, also had a specific a, a fruit specimen that I also kept in my bulk collection, for example. So I could put in the catalog number for that fruit. Let's say it's that. And I'm going to search in, I could either search in my collection or I could search in someone else's collection. Um, let's just go in mine and I can do a search and then it's gonna say, hey, do you mean this specimen? And I could click on it and make sure and take a look. And if it is, then I could say, yes, it's that specimen. And then I could come down and define the relationship between um, my specimen here and the specimen that I am linking. So in this case, I would probably say this is the originate, originating sample of, or actually this might be a subsample of. So we're talking about what is the relationship between this occurrence and the occurrence that is here. So this is a subsample of my main collection. And so if I create my, actually I might've said that backwards. Let's see, subsample of, I did say that backwards. Okay, learn by doing. This would actually mean that the specimen that I'm looking for right here on the page is a subsample of this one. So if I went, oops, that's wrong, I could click on this again. Oops, I could click on this and I would probably just remove that, add my identifier again. And then 
say, okay, this is actually the originating sample of, I didn't actually do my search. Do, 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 do. There we go. So I could say my occurrence right here is the originating sample of, let's pretend that this is a fruit that I have in my bulk collection. Okay, so that would be if I'm connecting it to an occurrence within my system. And if I wanted an external occurrence, it's a little bit more straightforward. I'm just gonna go in here and say, you would just put the external identifier. So say that's another catalog number or um, a global unique identifier that's provided. Then I would hopefully have a, a resource URL. So that's a URL to wherever I would want to link that the specimen. You still define the relationship here and then you click create association and then it will say you know whatever that relationship is has host blah 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 so for example if you had a, a piece of bark and then you had a mushroom that was found on that bark but that mushroom is in the micro portal and your bark is in your vascular plant collection this is how you connect those two Kimberly asks, does within system associations mark both symbiota records? That is a good question. Let's go see. Going to my record here, click occurrence editor, linked resources. Yes, so it looks like there's a, an inverse relationship that's going to be automatically applied to your other. Um, specimen record. And it looks like I've used this example before, so I should clean that up. So I think each of these relationships has its converse. And so when you're linking those two, then it's going to apply the converse to your specimen. Okay, and then lastly, in this associated occurrences box, uh, the last option is just an observational reference. So that could be if someone puts on the label, they're like visited by many bees, then you could say, okay, well, then I'm gonna put whatever larger taxonomic name I have for bees into this verbatim scientific name. And then I could say ecologically occurs with, and then you've created an ecological um, coexistence of bees with your specimen. Um, other questions. Let's see, Andy asks, did you just say that you can link records across two portals? Yes, you can. Um, it's not going to do that nice little linkage where it applies the converse to that other portal. Um, it will only be able to, you just put in an external identifier and a resource URL, but it doesn't actually um, change any of the data in the other portal. Um, let's see, Allison asks, if there's a bryophyte on a vascular and I make a separate specimen, is this external identifier a way to pull the specimen record from the plant to the bryo specimen I'm making from the stem of the plant? Um, you actually would not, you're not pulling any data in between the two, you're just creating a linkage between the two so that someone could click the the button next to so my public display um, they would be able to click it and oh, click the linked resources if i had a linked resource here and it would take you to the page of that bryophyte specimen rick uh, if i'm sitting on a bunch of this type of data is backend ingestion the best option yeah unless you want to spend your entire week just doing individual connections. We can do those associations on the back end. Currently no tools to batch create those associations. But those should be coming actually. I'm fairly confident that that's going to exist soon. Frank. Yeah, I was just gonna mention that in lichens, you very often have lichenicles fungi. So fungi that are parasitic on lichens. So that's kind of a good, good way to link them in the same portal because the lichen portal manages both. So um yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and then very quickly I'll talk about checklist vouchers, not 
in depth because this we'll talk about checklists more in a future symbiota support group because that's a, a much larger example but let's say you had a checklist already going um then this linked resources tab is also where you could link your specimen um particularly to a checklist so there's multiple ways of doing that and we'll go into that in a future symbiota support group but this is just like a one by one way you can do that this is also where you can search for um, duplicates that already exist. If you've already linked them, they would show up in this um, specimen duplicates area right here. My cat says hi. All right, lastly, we have, oh, and I also wanted to bring your attention to a new video that we have available, a new resource for you all. And uh, Lindsay will put this link in the chat. And it's just kind of a quick four minute intro to um, kind of how duplicates work in Symbiota. And this was particularly developed for a user who was saying like, hey, how do I, uh, how do I let people know if I have a, um, a re-identified specimen in one collection and the duplicates still have the old name on them? Um, so take a look at that video if you're interested in, in learning more about how you can look at conflicting identifications between duplicate specimens. Okay, last but certainly not least, we have um, a fairly rudimentary um, genetic resources tool here. Um, and this is just a way that you can create linkages between um, specimens and other um, repositories that might have those uh, genetic data. So we're talking about uh, GenBank or the Barcode of Life system, uh, that's where you can put these this information. So here we have genetic resources and you just add a new resource. It's pretty much text fields here. You decide what goes into these fields. Um, hopefully you have a locus, you have the GenBank or the bold URL and you just click that button there. Also currently no batch uploading um, capabilities, but we could definitely do this on the back end and will likely be available in the future. Okay, so once you have all of this information in a specimen, how do you access those data later on? Like where do they go in a download? Well, for associated occurrences or taxa, that information goes into a few particular fields. So if you have an associated occurrence that's more than just a taxon name, it will be um, put in a, in a concatenated form in the associated occurrences field. Um, or if you didn't provide any uh, specific identifiers, then it would be put in the associated taxa field because all it is is a taxon. Um, if you have a checklist linkage, currently I don't believe that is published anywhere. It's not um, included in your Darwin Core archive. Uh, your duplicate information, I believe that also goes into the associated occurrences field um, that was recently added. So hopefully those can be uh, harvested by our downstream aggregators. And then the genetic resources data gets concatenated in a standardized way and gets put into the associated sequences field. So if you're ever interested in, in accessing all that data that you've put into that highly normalized form, that's where you can get them from now. Um, okay, a couple of questions. Specify has several association fields in its data model. Could those be imported as such? Gustav, we'd probably just have to see what that data looks like and whether it's compatible with um, the associated occurrences tables that we have. Um, and as I mentioned, there aren't any current front end tools that can enable parsing of associated occurrences, but they might be able to be in the future. Um, Jennifer asks, do these genetic resources links show up in the full data view when searching for specimens? Uh, oh yeah, great question. If I go into my specimen record here, and if it did have genetic resources, let's just put some information here. And I went to the public display, then you would see a genetic tab here. 
And so you could actually see the, the genetic data listed. Um, and you have probably already noticed this, but if you go to a search collections page, one of the options you can select for here in the specimen criteria are um, specimens with genetic data. So you can specifically search for specimens that have genetic resources attached to them. Um, Andy says a new tool currently in beta testing has been developed for downloading GenBank formatted source modifiers. This will work in any portal. Shameless plug to come to the spinach um, conference. We're having a symposium there specifically about Symbiota tools. So we're excited to see Phil's talk there. Okay, one additional quick thing I wanted to show you all is just about taxon profiles. And these are variously filled out depending on the portal that you're in, but some uh, portals have some pretty nice taxon profiles filled out. So this is like your tertiary extension. This is information that has probably been aggregated from lots and lots of specimens by lots of experts um, and can be visible depending on how well populated the portal is. So this is what a taxon profile page looks like. It can have one or many uh, pictures associated with it. You can have field pictures associated with it. Um, if there aren't any field photos, then it will just be specimen pictures automatically if they exist. And then you can have one or many descriptions based on um, resources that have been contributed to that portal. Let me go look at one live and I'm going to switch over to the Signet portal for this because they have some pretty nice taxon profiles. And you can access this either by searching from the profile page here, the, um, the main search, or if I were doing a specimen search and I wanted to learn more about a taxon, then I could go here. do my specimen search. And then if you click on the name of a taxon associated with any specimen, as long as it's in the taxonomic thesaurus, then it would take you to the taxon profile page for the for that um, taxon. So there are quite a few resources linked here. In this case, we have a treatment from the flora of North America. It looks like someone has uh, also contributed Indiana flora and another Gleason and Cronquist flora. And then on the resources tab, you can also see linkages to other information about this taxon. Uh, you can look at all of the occurrences that are in the portal, or you could look at external resources. So there are links to flora of North America in this case, the IPNI, to Google Images, iNaturalist, NatureServe. So this is kind of a fun place that you can um, access information that has been aggregated about you know, specimens and observations by uh, lots and lots of people over lots and lots of time. So these, uh, these taxon profiles can only be edited by someone with particular taxon profile editor permissions. But if you know of any um, groups who are interested in helping to curate these, then we would uh, be open to discussion about that, or you can talk to your portal manager about whether they would be open to discussion about getting some more information into the taxon profile pages. As I mentioned, they uh, differ in the portal about how well uh, populated they are. Some don't have any descriptions, some have few field images, but you can contribute field images, you can contribute descriptions, um, depending on your taxonomic expertise and the, um, the, the portal community you're working in. Okay, so that was a whirlwind tour of just a few of the extended specimen tools that are available in Symbiota portals. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen now to see if anyone has any follow-up questions. I will say that these tools um, and tools around the, the extended specimen are some of the kind of most vigorously in development because there are a lot of people who are creating new data and wanting to access and share them in new ways. 
So you're likely to see some changes to these tools in the next few years. Any other questions? All right, well then I will stop recording.